Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you this morning. Welcome to those of you watching us online. Brant, how are you doing? I'm doing well. You're recovering from camp? I am still recovering from camp, a couple weeks at camp, and I'm sure you're recovering from Barbuda. And I heard you had a great time there yes, of ministry. Yes, we, we did. Had a great time of ministry. And welcome to all of you again. And also, we want to welcome baby Felix, right? Baby Felix, yes, there we go. Pastor Rudy and Lindsay welcomed baby Felix. Thursday, six pounds, 12 ounces, 18 inches long for all you statisticians out there when it comes to babies and stats. Uh, so we are uh, welcoming them. They're uh, staying at home today, recovering and taking care of things at home. So uh, I was yeah. going to say those stats are really important. I learned that early in ministry when I didn't know numbers, and that's very important to very important. It's very important to know. Yeah. yeah. And, and how just, dare I not know those I'm just going to focus on the name. I'm not going to yeah. worry about the stats and the weight and the length and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, we have something for families this week. Yes. Uh, we have a special activity on Wednesday evening. It's the Summer Family Fun Night uh, on July the 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Gene Adam Memorial Spray Park. And families are welcome to attend that. We just ask that one adult per family uh, should also attend. Uh, they will have snacks for you as well. And everyone should bring their own water bottles. So uh, it, this is probably going to be another hot week, it looks. So what a better way to spend Wednesday evening than the Juniata Memorial Spray Park. Awesome. Awesome. Momentum is this week. Yay. <laughs> I thought the kids would cheer more. Raise your hand if you're going. Momentum, students and leaders. We have 58 students and 14 leaders going, so that is quite the large group. Uh, reminder, students and parents of students attending, we have a meeting right after worship in here this morning. So as soon as worship's done, we'll give it about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're going to ask everybody else to clear out so we can start our meeting and get moving. Um, and uh, yeah, so make sure you're sticking around for that. Today, also, uh, please pray for us. It, it is always a great time of spiritual refreshment. Um, there's a lot of travel involved, so we appreciate your prayers. There are yellow prayer sheets available in the lobby. So if you look, uh, I think it's a half sheet, a yellow sheet that has the, the names, if you'd like to pray by name for all the people that are going, that'd be awesome. We'd really appreciate it. All right. Very good. Can you believe that the Family Fun Festival at Camp Manawagon is right around the corner? Uh, August the 18th. Remember, we'll have worship over at Camp Manawagon Family Fun Festival. Uh, one of the highlights of that day, we have worship underneath the tent, but then we follow the worship service with baptism. So if you or family member would like to be baptized, uh, please fill out the request at mgbconline.com under signups, and we will make sure that you get baptized that day over at Camp Manawagon. And we'll have more information, but... If you want to, take your phones right now. Make sure you put that date in there, August 18th at Camp Manawagon for Family Fun Festival. You have anything else, Brant? I think that's it. All right, terrific. Let me have that mic, and I want to invite Pastor Rick Horner up. Uh, some of you know Pastor Rick. Uh, pastor Rick was the associate pastor here at MGBC from 2006 to 2011, correct? Mm -hmm. And you left here and went to Connemaw Grace Brethren Church in Johnstown. How many know where Connemaw is? John, okay, most of you, yep, all right, some of you know. And so you were the pastor there. But you're here today because you wrote a book, correct? I, I and did. here's the book, Dysfunctional Families Can Change by Pastor Rick Horner. You can get a copy out at the table and see him. But first, I want to ask you a couple questions. Why did you write this book? What, what was the purpose behind writing it? Well... <laughs> That, 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 sound had nothing to do with that, that wasn't the purpose of writing the no. book, no. Okay. Let's try this again. What was the purpose of writing that book? Uh, I grew up in a dysfunctional family, and uh, all through my ministry time, uh, I've noticed relationships uh, being ruined, falling apart, and so I wanted to try to do what I could to try to help people that go through dysfunction and uh, are abused or neglected or whatever. And so I was doing a lot of that in my last church in Connemaw. So then when I retired, um, 
I had more time. True. It does happen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I decided that I wouldn't be <coughs> pr uh, preaching a lot of the answers that the scriptures give uh, about helping people with, with issues and, and uh, depression and so forth. So I figured the best thing to do would be to write about it. And you, you journal regularly as well, yes. correct? So yes. of some of the book was coming from your journal entries and things like that. Yes. Why the subject of dysfunctional families, though? Why did you focus on that? I guess because I uh, tried to help a lot of people in uh, the last church I was at. And there was a drug problem over there. And, and so um, it was a matter of trying to get into people's minds to help them to see um, why the issues were taking place. Yeah. And so I worked with a lot of that. So Understood. Understood. Yeah. Uh, if you were to summarize the book, what are some of the key points, the key elements, the main principles that you, you teach in the book, if okay. you were to summarize it? Uh, I discovered that there's basically four flawed parents, four types of uh, parents that cause dysfunction and read about that a little bit and then in my counseling I found that to be the case and then there are four personalities of, of children that respond to these uh, abusive parents these uh, controlling parents or these lenient parents or whatever and so as I was talking with people and counseling with them it was surprising how many uh, families fit into that situation you know uh, one person was a loner and didn't want to deal with the problems. Another, another uh, sibling was a, uh, a mascot, and he was always trying to get people to laugh and trying to uh, play down the tension and so forth. And so uh, uh, I talk about that a lot. Other people have talked about those uh, four uh, parents and four uh, children, but nobody's put them together in the way of trying to help them with families and counsel with them. And uh, I guess a second uh, reason for this is I really believe that God wants us to, with the knowledge that we have and the Holy Spirit living inside of us, he wants us to look for people that are struggling and see what we can do to help them. And so I tried to put some principles from the scripture in, in the book. And uh, I think that a lot of us who have been believers for a while, uh, if we knew what to say, a lot of us want to help people, but if we knew what to say and how to tackle the issues, we could be counselors ourselves without having a, a degree or, or having that job description. Uh, and so the idea is to help uh, other mature Christians to, to help dysfunctional families. Terrific. Yeah, it's, uh, I've read the book. It's excellent. Uh, it's highly practical to apply to our lives when you engage other individuals in our communities, in our world. Uh, to be able to c connect with them and counsel them and lead and guide and direct them. Any summary points? Anything else you want to add? Um, just let me say that I think forgiveness is a significant role that people have to consider. And it's very hard uh, if for a child who's been put down or uh, physically or sexually abused, very hard to forgive uh, that cruel parent or other sibling or whatever. Uh, so the scripture says a lot about it. Jesus says a lot about it. And I think we can learn to be able to let go of uh, the pain and the, the crime that other people have committed against us. With God's help, we can do that. So I write a lot about that in the book as well. Terrific. Well, thank you for coming thank today. And uh, you. your table is in the back. Yes. And if you want to stop by, you'll sign the book for us. I'll be happy to. All right. If you want to purchase a copy of the book, it's in the back there to the left as you go out through the main, through the main doors. And thank you for coming and sharing with us. The only problem with signing the book uh -huh. is since we've been away from Martinsburg for a long time, and since I'm over 65, all kinds of people, although there's a lot of people I've never seen before, but a lot of my old friends, I can't remember their first name. <laughs> so I'm going to have to ask what your name is again before That's fine. I sign the book. Yeah, so if he asks your name, don't take it as an insult. He's just forgotten who you are. And <laughs> so, so tell him your name and so he can make it a personalized autograph. Right. To, very, very good. So thank you. Please stand and uh, worship with Ryan and the praise team this morning. <laughs> Jesus.
to the people around you.
All right, let me try this again. That's my fault. I got the mute on. So it is time for our ushers to come forward as we uh, collect the offering today. And this is our opportunity in another way to worship the Lord as we give back what he has so graciously given to us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for all that you are doing and how you've blessed us with so many blessings. Even uh, was mindful uh, that in America we are so rich and so blessed in so many ways. Just the, the blessing of air conditioning where even in Europe it's just not, not as much of the blessing that we have here. And we, we, are, we are so rich that we sometimes forget just how good you are and what you've given to us. So help us to just appreciate all of the things you've done for us. And as we give back to you, that you can use this offering to impact this world for your kingdom. And uh, it's so wonderful to know that you, you're working and you're going to change lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And at this time, there's going to be uh, an interview of concerning Crossroads Pregnancy Center. Okay, this is Stephanie. Um, she spoke at our Daughters of the King banquet, so some of you may recognize her face. Um, she represents Crossroads Pregnancy Center, and um, we took up an offering and donated to the center um, from the banquet to um, help with their ministry. And our church leadership asked if we would have Stephanie come back and address the whole church body to inform you um, about their ministry. So my first question, Stephanie, is can you give us a brief overview of the center's beginning and the services that they provide? Okay, so they told me to be brief, and I'm really going to try, but there's so much, so I hope you guys will stop and talk to me afterwards, but Crossroads originally started in 1985 out of a Mennonite Bible study in Belleville, PA, and a group of women who wanted to address the issue of life and how they could help, and so it was birthed out of that, and over the years has grown and spread, and there there are now five offices throughout Central PA um, in four different counties, and um, our newest one most two years ago, opening in Altoona, and all of them are licensed medical pregnancy clinics um, so that we can do the ultrasounds, pregnancy tests, everything right there. Uh, Dr. Deborah Pike, many of you know, she's this neck of the woods. Um, she is our medical director and oversees all of the orders um, that come through. And so we're able to meet with these men and women right where they're at in the midst of their um, sometimes crisis, sometimes not a crisis, sometimes it's just um, they don't have insurance, you know, and they, they need that confirmation of pregnancy. And so we do that, but then we take it a step further. So then we are also um, doing educational classes. We are giving them points for those classes so they can have material assistance, new cribs, car seats, strollers. You know, we know moms and dads out there know what it takes to have a baby and the things that you need. And we don't want to just help them decide on life. We want to equip them and empower them to be able to be good moms and dads. And so we do that. We do um, post-abortion counseling if needed. Um, we have a teen program. We have a dad program that meets one-on-one -on -one men meeting with dads, which we know that's important, right? We're, we want to equip men to be the dads God created them to be. And so um, we have other dads coming in to help. So there's a lot that happens in those five offices on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, how is the gospel, you touched on it a little bit, how is the gospel incorporated into the ministry? So many ways. That's the point, okay? Um, that's the purpose, is to share the gospel. And so we always ask to pray with our clients at the end of each session, those parenting classes, 95% of the time, they say sure. And we get to watch God work through their prayers, you know, watch them, watch God answer prayers for them, lead them and their family. And we do 
Bible studies. So if a mom, you know, there are a lot of them are coming for that emotional support. And so many times it might be baby two, baby three, and they're still coming to crossroads not to get stuff. They have points racked up galore, but they're coming for that emotional support. So if they've exhausted all of our classes, and there's hundreds of them, so it takes a lot, um, but we'll say, do you want to do a Bible study? Because we've built that relationship now, and it's all about relationship. You know, we Jesus was the hands and feet first, right? He met their physical needs, and then when um, the doors opened and an opportunity presented himself, then he worked on the heart issues. And that's the mission of Crossroads, to meet the needs where we're at, but then share the gospel because we want to connect them to a church. And so we also do what's called a LAMB project. LAMB stands for love a mom and baby. And that's something um, that your church has agreed to participate in. But essentially, if we have a client who maybe otherwise would not get a baby shower, we have women from a local church congregation come into our office and host a baby shower for her there. And so that is our handoff to the church because we're not able to do it all as a ministry and we need the church to come alongside of us. And so that is what we do with, um, with the lamb showers. Uh, real quick, I want to go back. I'm sorry for the tech people. I was talking and not listening or looking, but I do that often. Um, there's an ultrasound for the medical piece so that you guys can see what our clients see when they come in. Um, this is actually at our Altoona office. This is a seven week, seven week or nine week maybe, baby. Essentially it's this big, okay? And we're able to show her exactly what that baby looks like. We're able to point out the little head up there and the arms and the little leg buds and a yolk sac and what that does for the baby. But we called this our praising baby. And so if you want to go ahead and play it. So you can see its little hands wiggling, it's a moving. And so that gives personhood to that baby. Thanks guys. So we called that our praising baby because when we put that ultrasound down, it was just kind of moving and grooving. And that mom was able to see something this little that she's told is nothing but a clump of cells, has hands, has feet, has brain waves, and is praising even in the womb. And we know that's scriptural. So, sorry. <laughs> no, very good. Um, and you already touched on the LAM project, but are there, are there other ways that the local church body can help you and be involved. Yeah, absolutely. So there are 14 of us staff that work in five offices. You can do the math. It's not much. <laughs> okay. So um, we are always looking for volunteers and that changes different seasons, different offices need different things. Um, so if it's something you're interested in helping with, we always encourage you to contact for you guys. The local office would be Altoona. Pray, pray, pray. I can't stress that enough. Um, we have what's called an Echo Prayer app where we will post something and it comes right to your phone, um, alerting you to pray, just like a text message would. And we need our army. You're an army. We're boots on the ground, but we're nothing without the army that stands behind us. And so we need and appreciate your prayers. Um, we have events that are coming up. One of them is September 17th, and it's our annual banquet. And... That's a great opportunity, and I would invite all of you to come. It is September 17th at the Blair County Convention Center, and um, it's free. It's free to attend. I'm going to give you a free food, okay, free dinner. Um, but we encourage you to come and bring people with you, you know, bring people with you who might not know about the ministry of Crossroads. It is a fundraising banquet. So yes, there's an ask at the end. And probably as a development director, I shouldn't say this, but here we go. Don't tell anybody. I don't care if at the end you give. I don't care if you give financially. My heart is that you guys would come and learn about the ministry, who we are, 
hear from our executive director, hear from the client testimonies, see what the ministry is doing right in our backyard and the difference it's making here. And then if you choose to partner with us financially, wonderful. But just come and learn about what God's doing and pray about if it's something you should be part of. Okay, um, actually, MGBC has a representative that is Beth Hasbrook. She's not here this week. Um, so if, if you know who Beth is and you have any questions, go to her, contact me, and I'll direct you to Beth. Yeah. But um, feel free to reach out to us on this. Um, after the service, Stephanie and I will both be out at the North X at the table. Um, if you'd like to stop by, if you need any more information about the LAM project, um, we're just taking some names right now and would like to form a couple possible teams to um, do some showers in the future. So um, come see us after the service. Yeah, and if you guys have any questions, my business card is back there. Um, any questions at all, we'd always prefer that you ask. Um, ask us and don't assume. <laughs> if you have questions and whatever, come talk to us. Give me a call um, or send me an email. But we hope to see you guys in September. Thank you for supporting us. Um, there aren't as many churches as you would think that back pregnancy centers. Um, it's a divided issue. And our theme for this year is united for life. That's our heart. That's our goal. That church barriers and divisions would come down and that we could come together to stand for life in our communities, for the gospel in our communities. So we'd invite you to be part of that. Thanks, guys. I invite you to stand with us as we worship. Go ahead and talk to the people around you for a minute or two so we can get set and it's not awkwardly quiet. And then we'll sing here in a minute. Against me shall prosper. 
prosper. Lord, just feed me your goodness, your mercy. They will follow. Lord, just feed me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. against me shall prosper Lord just lead me your goodness your mercy they will follow Lord just is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. And I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense, so I won't. He's 
Father God, you have been faithful. No matter the twists and turns of our lives, you are there, you are consistent, you are constant, you are God, everlasting. 
Father, forgive us when we have failed you. Forgive us when we sin. Forgive us for not yielding to the call of what you put on our life, for, for not engaging when you've called us to engage, Father. Forgive us for our sins that we have committed against you. And thank you for your grace and your mercy and your faithfulness to us. I give this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and King. Amen. You may be seated. Children, Miss Jerry is over there on your right. Miss Erin is over there on your left. Please be careful at the intersection down here this morning, but have a great time at children's worship. Thanks, guys. I bring you greetings from the people of the island of Barbuda in the Caribbean. Uh, they were not impacted by Hurricane Barrel, I think was the name of it, but uh, many of the islands just south, I know that St. Vincent, many of the people on uh, the island of Barbuda uh, had family um, on St. Vincent, and it was a Cat 5 hurricane that went through. Uh, probably many of you have seen the oceans are extremely warm for this time of year. It's very rare that they would be this warm, and even the Barbudan people are going to the beach and swimming and say, wow, the water's too warm, and so that causes this, and so uh, we just pray uh, for protection, for safety uh, during this hurricane season. I will also uh, tell you, over the next couple of weeks, I'll be sharing some different aspects of our, of our trip there. The, the team of seven went, went down. Uh, we had the opportunity to minister and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with uh, 46 uh, students, children that came to the basketball camp and learned the skills of basketball, and we had the opportunity to share the gospel throughout that week with them. And so, uh, as I said, we'll be sharing a little bit more each week in the coming weeks about what the ministry was there uh, on, on the island. And thank you for your support, your encouragement, and thank you for the team of uh, seven that went and, and uh, shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 13, Pastor Brandt indicated last week that uh, in Matthew chapter 13, we have this series of parables, uh, stories that Jesus shared with the Jewish people as uh, he was teaching. And uh, these parables uh, were to reflect the character of the king as well as the characteristics of the kingdom, what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Now, a parable, the word parable literally means to come alongside or to set alongside. So what Jesus does is he takes a spiritual concept and then he sets it alongside something that the people, his listeners, his audience, he sets it alongside something that they are aware of, that they're familiar with, an object or a, a situation or, or something in their culture that they're familiar with. He sets the two alongside to try to expose them and open their mind to what the kingdom is like. And so today, what Jesus does, he takes the spiritual concept of the kingdom of God and he sets it alongside a field of wheat. And so that's what we're going to explore today. We're going to, we're going to take a look at that and what, what that looks like and why Jesus did what he did. Now, sometimes these parables were very confusing to his followers. Uh, last week, Brant read to you the parable of the sower. Remember, some seed fell on the good soil, bad soil, weeds, all of that. And he shared that with you. And then he said, later, Jesus gives an explanation as to what that parable means. We're going to do the same thing today. No greater explanation of the parable than to have the Savior himself explain it in his words. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the parable, and then we'll also look at the passage in which Jesus explains what the parable is about. I don't need to tell you this, but the world is a mess. It's a mess. Um, each generation says that it's the worst time that it's ever been. You know, I mean, my grandfather said this world's a mess, and my dad said this world's a mess, and it's worse than the previous generation before that. And so I'm going to go on record as saying at 63 years old, this world is a mess, and it's worse than I've ever seen it. That is up for debate, however you want to look at it. 
There's two current wars going on that have global impact. Global warming, whether you believe in it or not, is an issue. Deterioration of the press, media, fake news, conspiracy theories, gender confusion, terrorism, threat of nuclear conflict, failing education system, deterioration of the family. Also, violence. Um, you don't have to look any further than the events of last night and the potential assassination attempt or the assassination attempt on uh, former President Trump and his life. Uh, I will also tell you that America is known for its violence. Uh, we were on the island, and we had an opportunity here over the last couple of weeks to work with a, a young lady, 10 years old, by the name of Helen, and the team will know who I'm talking about when I talk about Helen. And I asked Helen, I said, Helen, have you ever been to the United States? She said, no. I said, would you, would you like to go sometime? Would you like to visit? She said, no, it's too dangerous there. This is a 10-year-old that sees America as a violent nation, a nation that cannot control itself, that seems to want to hurt and produce evil and violence against one another. Satan and evil are at work in our world, and Satan is seeking to defeat the purposes and the mission of Jesus. He won't be successful, but he sure can impact and crush a lot of lives in the process. So Jesus would speak about his kingdom and this world in the parable of the weeds. First, he tells this story publicly in Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. And then later, the disciples give, ask Jesus to give them a private explanation as to what the parable means. And we'll look at both of these. But first, we need to get some ground rules. We have to look at the parable that we're going to look at this morning from the Jewish cultural perspective. We have to understand and look at it. Remember, Jesus is teaching this to the Jewish people at that time. And their expectation was that they were looking for Jesus to be a great political leader, a Messiah, one that could come in, a political have political clout and would, would lead them up against the Romans. He would be a military leader from the line of King David. He would set up a new nation of Israel and, and, and he would restore them to the greatness that they once had. In fact, the Jewish race, the Jewish people would rule alongside this Messiah. So when Jesus tells them that his kingdom is like a field that has weeds growing up and the righteous people will live alongside the evil people, this just blows their mind. And that's what we're going to see. His kingdom is like a field of wheat with weeds in it. Take a look here at the passage of Scripture. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore again, bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. We have to be careful when reading parables. Parables that we don't try to over-spiritualize everything and look at each detail and go, okay, well, that's what that means, and that has spiritual emphasis here, and that has a spiritual connection here. We, we have to be careful not to over-spiritualize the story. Jesus taught this for one main important point. A man sowed good seed in his, feed, in his field. The seed was free of weeds. It was pure seeds. Another man, an enemy, came after him and scattered a bunch of weed seeds in the field. You got the picture, got the mental idea. It's an enemy, comes at night, 
plants a good pure field of wheat and then an enemy comes in and throw these seeds of weeds all throughout. And the weeds grew up along with the wheat. In time, the servants noticed that there's something wrong with this field. It's got some weeds in it. So they asked Jesus, was there something wrong with the seeds? Were they not pure? And Jesus says, the, the master says, no, I planted pure seeds. But what happened was an enemy came in the middle of the night seeking to destroy my field and planted weeds in it. So they want to know, what, what, what should we do? Well, how, how, how can we take care of this? You, do you want us to go out and pull all the weeds up out of the field? And the master responds, no. Since the two have grown up together, if you weed the field you'll pull the good wheat up with the weeds. Let them grow together, collectively together, and then at harvest time, when we reap the field, we'll take both the weeds and the wheat and bring them all together, and we'll, we'll reap them all together. And then at that time, we'll separate the good wheat from the bad weeds. Now, intermission, stop, pause, Jesus, after giving this parable, gives two more parables, different parables. We'll come back and look at them in a week or so. All right, we'll come back and hit those. But each of those begins with the idea the kingdom of heaven is like, and he goes on to explain about the mustard seed and about the leaven. So we've got the parable of the weeds and this little intermission, this interjection of these two parables in between. And then Jesus is going to give an explanation. All right? I want to make sure that you understand. I think the main point of what Jesus is trying to get here is, listen, my kingdom is in process. It's going to take time. There's time involved. There's time for the mustard seed to grow and time for leaven to spread throughout and time for good seeds to grow and time for weeds and wheat to grow. He's talking about time here. Jesus seems to be trying to get them to understand that his fullness, his completeness of his kingdom isn't going to occur in the same time frame that you think it is. So Jesus gives an explanation. Later that day, after the crowds have gone, the people have gone away back to their home, Jesus and his disciples go into the house, and they ask him, they say, Jesus, would you please explain the parable that you told about the wheat and the weeds? And so here's what he says. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. These are Jesus' words as he's explaining this parable to them. First thing he does is he goes through the characters, right? He points out who the characters are and who they represent. He's going to give a character explanation to the parable. The master sower is Jesus. He's the son of man. The field of the master is um, the world, Please make sure that you understand, when he's talking about the field there, he's not talking about the church. He's talking about the world, everyone, the all-encompassing world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom, the followers of Jesus, those that seek righteousness and obedience to God. Uh, Brant uh, talked to you about the, the seed that was spread by the, the sower, and you remember the last seed that was sowed fell on fertile ground, and it produced fruit multiple times over. What Jesus is doing here is he's connecting these two parables together. He's taking the parable of the sower and the good seed that produced fruit, and he's connecting it with this parable with respect to the wheat. He's linking them together. The weeds here, they represent evil evil lives, the lost, those individuals and circumstances under the control and authority of Satan, those that seek to do evil in the world, and those that push back against the counsel of God and the purposes of God. The enemy that came in the middle of the night, they were good seeds that were sowed in that 
field, righteous seeds. The enemy that came in the middle of the night sowing the weeds is Satan, the devil, the deceiver, the enemy of God. He seeks to destroy all that God does, all of his purposes. That's what Satan seeks to do. The harvest refers to the end of the age. Jesus himself tells them that the harvest is the end of the age. That time when Jesus will return and he will complete his kingdom. Again, there's a time factor here. Jesus is clearly not talking about a current political kingdom of that day. He's not talking about restoring the Jewish people at that time. That's not what he's getting at because he's referring to something future, way down the line when he returns again after his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and he returns again. The reapers are the angels. They do the bidding of God. They do the mission of God, the ministry of God. Those are the reapers. They will come and carry out the commands of God the Father at the end of the age. So he's outlined the characters. Now the question is, okay, Jesus, now we understand who all these individuals are in your parable. What does it mean? What's it about? Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus, the Son of Man, will send his angels and he will reap a harvest. They will bring in both the product of the good, the righteous, and the weeds, the product of the bad seed, the wicked, and the sinful. And there will be a judgment. They will be harvested all together and there will be a judgment. That judgment will take place. Literally, what Jesus is saying here is in that judgment that the wicked will be separated from the righteous and they will be discarded. Literally, they will be placed into hell. There will be emotional and physical suffering of those evil doers. But the righteous, Jesus says, will shine like the sun. Oh, we'll talk just a little bit more about that later. So, Jesus tells this parable. You understand the parable. You know all the characters. You know the purpose and the meaning. What does it have to do with us today? 2,000 years later in Martinsburg, Pennsylvania. What does it mean for you and for me? Well, first of all, we need to make sure we understand that he's not talking about the local church. In verse 38, he's talking about the world. Jesus says this is his worldwide kingdom. In a few more chapters, Matthew's going to write in Matthew 18 how the church is to go through church discipline. That is, if you have an individual in the church, someone that's sinning, a weed in the church, the church is supposed to take that unrepentant sinner and remove them from the church and put them out. So Jesus is clearly not talking about the church here. He's talking about his worldwide kingdom. The second thing that Jesus is talking about and making sure that we understand is that the righteous and the wicked will be together. Jesus' kingdom is not yet complete. Uh, Theologians call his arrival of the kingdom, which came when Jesus came, the inauguration of the kingdom. One day when Jesus returns to this earth in judgment, he will consummate and complete his kingdom, but He's, we're not there yet. We're in process. And while we're in process, the weeds and the wheat, the sinners, the righteous and the evil live together. I find it interesting that um, in Israel, particularly, they have a weed that's called the bearded darnel. Uh, This weed, when it's consumed, can cause sickness. It... uh, has seeds on it that can produce toxicity. They, in in a heavy enough dose, it can kill people. Um, It it makes them very sick, can produce vomiting. It tastes very, very bitter. The the, The clinching factor here is that it looks a lot like wheat. 
In fact, in Roman law, they forbid the planting of bearded darnel. And if you did plant bearded darnel in and among the wheat, there were significant, serious punishment for an individual that would do that. But Jesus is being highly personal here. He's talking about something they all understood with respect to planting these weeds in and among the wheat. Sometimes it's hard to spot the evil among us. It looks a lot like us sometimes, and it's hard to see. But pulling these weeds, the, weirded, the bearded Darnell, out at the proper time can also pull out the wheat because the roots grow together. Ed John would write this, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. For whatever reason, God has permitted the evil to be amidst among us. That we grow together, we live together, righteous and evil, together in his kingdom that is yet to be complete. Why would he do this? Certainly, God is powerful enough that if he wanted to, he could wipe out all evil and end it, right? For some reason, he chooses not to. The short answer, mercy. Peter would write this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's extending his patience. The evil is growing alongside the righteous, and he's extending his patience that the word of God, the gospel, will reach some of them, and they will be saved. God's mercy, his great mercy, he desires time to pass so that some of these weeds can come to the Savior. Uh, The other thing you need to be aware of in this whole process, and I know that we talk about it sometimes, but I'm really not sure we grasp this, but there is a spiritual war going on. There is a spiritual war going on. We would be wise to remember this in our interactions with others in our daily lives. We are living in an evil world The Holy Spirit is restricting the power of Satan. Imagine that. The Holy Spirit is restricting the power of Satan. Imagine if he wasn't. What an evil world we live in and how much worse it would be. The evil one seeks to uproot the righteousness of God, to destroy his purposes and his plans, his desires to plant evil words, his desires to plant evil thoughts, his desires to plant evil actions in this world. The third thing, God's glory is best seen in contrast. Perhaps one of the reasons why evil and righteousness are together in this world is because in the midst of the contrast that we see the glory and power and majesty of God. In the midst of this war, we're called to live a righteous life. We're called to be salt and light. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? We must live in contrast to evil that is around us. And in doing so, a watching world sees what true righteousness is. Jesus would pray this in his high priestly prayer in John 17. I have given them your word. He's praying to God his Father. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. I take this to see that we are here in the midst of an evil world. Jesus hasn't taken us out for a purpose because... We are to show the truth. We are to live lives of righteousness and truth, to speak truth. Listen, if the church isn't doing its job of sharing the truth, we're in serious trouble and we're not fulfilling the purpose of the church. Next, to the power of the church. 
How do we stand in an evil world? If we're wheat growing alongside the weeds, righteousness and sinfulness, how do we stand? Well, it's the power of the church. Uh, you have a picture there, and uh, Linda Biddle brought in this uh, wheat, this group of wheat here. Uh, it's very interesting. Dwayne, I think it was Dwayne, you did the, the devotional down. We have devotions each morning at 6 a.m. In, in Bermuda when we go on trips. 5.45, wake up, 6 o'clock, uh, devotions. And Dwayne did one of the devotions that day, and he talked about planting wheat from an agricultural background. I, have, I don't know anything about it, but one of the most important things in planting wheat is that you plant the seeds close together, very dense, very compacted. The reason is so that you don't leave room for weeds to grow up in between. The other reason why you do that in planting the wheat as they grow they kind of support one another. They're so packed together so that when high winds come, they kind of lean on each other and support each other. The, the stems of the stalk of wheat are very fragile and they can snap very easily. But when you put them together and plant them closely together, they support one another just like the church is supposed to do in supporting one another when we struggle, when we face difficulties, when we come in contact with evil. The power of the church. We support one another. We care for one another. The followers of Christ in the evil world will need one another in order to survive and in order to take care of one another and meet the challenge. Uh, finally, take heart. God will one day wipe evil from this earth. In time, his time, evil will be eradicated. Jesus is quoting from the end times when he says... That we will shine like the sun. Remember that passage? We will shine like the sun. He's quoting from the prophet Daniel. Take a look at this. And there shall be a time of trouble. Daniel's talking about the tribulation period. Such as never has been seen. There was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness. That's what Jesus was quoting from Daniel. Shine like this brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Did you see that? Did you see that? Daniel is prophesying that one day this kingdom is going to come place and weeds and wheat will grow together. And the purpose of that is that so that many will turn to righteousness. Our purpose in this world and living alongside the evil and the sin is to demonstrate a life that brings them to Jesus Christ and turns them from their evil deeds and their evil ways to righteousness. Jesus would close out his parable by saying, He who has ears, let him hear. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let them hear. This would be a repeated phrase. If you look at the seven churches in Revelation, and you know where I'm talking about, first three chapters of Revelation, he talks to the churches. Jesus talks to the churches and uses the same language. He describes the Antichrist. John describes the Antichrist, and he says, listen, those who have ears, let them hear. Now, everyone has ears. Jesus' words are for everyone, no matter their race, status, age, spiritual position, spiritual maturity. But while everyone has ears, some will only hear words and not really listen to them. Some will obey their hearts. They will turn their hearts. They will listen. They'll obey. And they'll act upon the words of Jesus. Do you know why? Because they believe that he is the Messiah, the King. He is the risen Son of God. And some will believe that. And so therefore, they will listen. They have ears and they will hear. Others, not so much. So as I close this morning, let me ask you a couple questions. Did you merely listen to the sermon today? Or did you truly seek to understand, that is, to know the character of God, to know who he is, and to know the characteristics of his kingdom? Did you search for God in these words, in the parables, or were they just kind of a neat, cool, symbolic story for you? 
Do you believe that there's a spiritual war going on around you? And that we as wheat, as righteous, need to live differently than the weeds and the sinful? Do you fully realize and, re- and rely upon the power of the church in your day-to-day life? Do you really understand how important this is? In a world full of evil weeds, do you understand how important this is to your spiritual growth and your spiritual survival? My sermon last week at Abundant Life a Church in Barbuda was about having a relationship with God. Having a relationship with God. And here's how I summarize the, the point of this sermon. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. Now listen carefully, because I'm going to make a statement, and then I'm going to pray. But make sure you hear this statement. Do you simply know about God, or do you desire to know him and pursue a relationship with him? Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your love, for your grace. Thank you for the kingdom, Father. And while we watch the events, uh, many of the things we watched last night on TV over and over, and we see evil and evil carrying out and trying to carry out its ways, Father, you have called us to be salt and light. You've called us to live in the midst of a world of evil. You have called us to show the love of Jesus Christ, even while Satan has power and he seeks to destroy your purposes and your plans. Father, strengthen us. Help us to rely upon you, to trust you, to not just know information about you and the great stories of the Bible and the parables, but to have a relationship with you, to know you, to pursue you. Father, I would just ask that you would provide strength, provide us with blessing, support us during difficult times when evil rears its head, Father, Help us to be salt and light, to stand firm for the truth and show a world of weeds what the truth of the gospel looks like. I give this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's stand together. in vain a thousand ways my fears to quell my hopes to raise but what I need your word has said is ever only Jesus you died you live you reign There's love in all your words and deeds. This weary heart finds all it needs in never only Jesus. I want to know you, Jesus my Lord, King of the heavens. King of my soul, I trade my treasures and all my rewards, Jesus, to know you and know you more. Oh, son should curse me for your name I have no fear I have no shame you stand with me for all my days my ever only Jesus I want to know you Jesus my Lord King of the heavens King of my soul I trade my treasures in 
and all my rewards, Jesus, to know you, then know you more. Like wave after wave on the ocean, like all of the sand on the shore, your beauty and glory are endless. Oh, Jesus, I must know you more. Like wave after wave on the ocean, like all of the sand on the shore, your beauty and glory are endless. Oh, Jesus, I must know you more. I want to know. Jesus, my Lord, King of the heavens, King of my soul, I trade my treasures and all my rewards, Jesus, to know you, then know you more. Jesus to know you, then know you more. As we close this morning, I remind you that we have our reflection questions online, our discipleship resources. Uh, one question in particular we want to draw your attention to is this. Jesus closes this parable by saying, he who has ears, let him hear very simple statement, but there's a lot of depth to that. So take some time to reflect on that, discuss what this means, share with your family and with your small groups and just other people that are in attendance today. Take some time to reflect on today's message. We're thankful you chose to join us this morning. You're dismissed. And in about 10 minutes, we'll start our momentum meeting. So if you're not part of that and could clear out by about 1145, we'd appreciate it. Have a great week.